Uh, actually, with the shrapnel flying around everywhere from the Brexit battle, the Lord Mayor of the City of London has been in Australia. Now, this is not the, the Lord Mayor, the job Boris Johnson one ha once had. This is the Lord Mayor of the City, the second-ranked financial centre in the world after New York. Lord Mayor Peter Eslin is here to pitch trade and investment. I asked him first how the city was weathering Brexit. Clearly, uh, we would like resolutions to, uh, to, to where we stand to, to give greater certainty. Uh, but you know, during the scale of Brexit or during the time frame of Brexit, you know, we've seen growth in employment. We've seen you know, further growth of, of, of capital inflows. So, I mean, it's been a frustrating process because, you know, frankly, one's dealing with that uncertainty. But actually underpinning it is a lot of opportunity. So when we hear articles, obviously it's become so polarised, yeah. the issue of Brexit. Yeah. And when we hear that uh, financial institutions are leaving the city, going to Europe yeah. or Ireland, yeah. um, money is pouring out of London in yeah. droves, what yeah. is the story? Well, the story is, is, is not that. I mean, clearly individual businesses are making decisions, but I'm not aware of any business that has relocated lock, stock and barrel to, uh, to the continent. Uh, in fact, the reverse. I've seen businesses coming into the city because they want to continue to access the capital markets, uh, and so they see London as being critical to their future. But there have been businesses, rightly so, that want to make sure that they're positioned for any eventuality and, of course, have positioned themselves in you know, Dublin, Luxembourg, wherever, and, and taken some of their workforce. But the aggregate numbers are around about 5,000, 7,000 people. You know, and when you then put that alongside the 30,000, 40,000 jobs that have been created through fintech and cyber and, and the other areas, that's why we're seeing a net growth. So, I mean, it's a complex issue. There is a degree of polarisation, but that polarisation is around different facets, mm. and, and, and that's so, the challenge. And so if, um, if there is, there's still a slight chance that there might be a crash out on October 31. Uh, we hear manufacturing's going to be hit probably the worst. How would the city handle it, do you think? Well, and that's that, that, therein lies the challenge in the sense that, I mean, the city as a service centre, um, I wouldn't say is immune, but has basically prepositioned itself for any outcome. As you rightly point out, uh, it, it is the businesses that are involved in the movement of goods um, that are at risk. Uh, and the question is, is you know, if the EU, for example, turn around and say they're not going to accept an extension and, and we crash out, the reality is we haven't fundamentally changed the fact that businesses still want to trade with each other. Uh, and therefore, there's going to be a slowdown, there's going to be inconvenience. Those barriers will need to be overcome, and relatively quickly. I thought a, a really interesting sign of how London is sitting at the moment was the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Uh, rather surprising mm -hmm. bid for the London Stock Exchange in yeah. the last few days. Yeah. Was it a surprise to people in London, and what's your response to it? I mean, it was a surprise because, uh, I mean, largely, um, you know, if we look at the work of the London Stock Exchange specifically as a business, and I've been working with them in building the Stock Connect with, with Shanghai, uh, and, and that tie-up, you know, is in its early days, but it seems to be very successful. I mean, it's, m it's more a sort of a, a mutual uh, participation rather than a consolidation. Uh, secondly, you had the interesting announcement of Refinitiv uh, and London Stock Exchange, which from the market seemed, the market was, I think, generally very positive towards that. So this is a sort of data, uh, data asset to rival Bloomberg? Yes, yeah, a data asset to rival Bloomberg, but also, I think, fundamentally looking at it differently in the sense of data itself is becoming an asset class in its own right. Uh, and the value of that data, not only to the markets, but also potentially as a commodity, and really starting to see where that would go. And so that's quite attractive. I'm not sure where it will end up, mm. but it's, it's exciting. But obviously, if that went ahead, then Charles Lee, chief executive of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, wouldn't be able to do his deal. No, I mean, he says you and the, 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 him, the, his stock exchange and London Stock Exchange are Romeo and Juliet. Well... Uh, uh, that's an unfortunate analogy, really, because... Um, it is, rather, if they, you they, think they, about they the both, end of it. <laughs> they, they both ended up uh, going out of action. So um, I think I, I would look at it as perhaps opportunistic, maybe from the point of view of the, of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Mm. I mean, ultimately... Do you think it's a cry of help from business over in Hong Kong? Like business in Hong Kong, I, I mean, I've met Charles Lee. Look, he's a very, you know, a very eminent, very sensible businessman. And so, I mean, I don't understand the long-term rationale for that transaction. Mm. I mean, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange is a big marketplace, um, uh, obviously a different marketplace uh, to the UK. So, I mean, I think what will need to happen is there'll need to be greater clarity as to, well, what is that deal? 
you know, who's it really benefiting? Uh, and is it one that actually shareholders fundamentally you know, see as a positive outcome? Um, you know, put aside whether the UK see the stock exchange as a critical national asset and what, in, what elements they may wish to, 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 to uh, infer on that. Well, we're talking about Refinitiv there. Let me ask you about fintech uh, and, and indeed uh, the whole digital space, which London seems to be powering ahead with. Mm. Um, there is a connection with Australia. What, what sort of connections uh, are we making? Australia presents uh, not only a marketplace in its own right, but an access to Asia-Pacific more broadly. Uh, and of course, one would hope that, and as we're seeing, for Australian businesses coming to the UK, the UK continues to be an access point, I hope, continually uh, through into Europe and to, to further afield. So I think there's real opportunities there, and that's evidenced by, obviously, the traffic that's already moving across the bridge. But what I want to see happening is, is that bridge becoming a, a, a motorway, not just a sort of a footbridge. If uh, Brexit does happen, uh, Australia and Britain are looking at uh, a free trade agreement. You've spoken with the Treasurer. How enthused are you about this, and what difference could it make? Well, I think there's uh, excitement on both, uh, both sides. I mean, I've spoken to the Secretary of State uh, for International Trade uh, in the, for the UK. So I think there's real excitement. Um, and, you know, obviously it is predicated on Brexit. We're also looking at the proliferation of services. And that's an attractive proposition to Australian, uh, and Australian businesses. Uh, and, and it's not attractive to the UK. I mean, we're 80% services now in the UK. So, but developing the framework that goes with that, whether it's around data, whether it's around international taxation and international uh, intellectual property, you know, these elements need to be put into ongoing agreements. And the desire of the UK is to very much internationalise that agenda clearly through bilateral engagement in the first instance, but to seek multilateral um, agreements as well. Finally, Lord Mayor, you mentioned green mortgages there. Uh, I wanted to ask you, because you're very passionate about uh, green finance, um, is London the place where uh, the great inroads and the pioneering in green finance will, will be t is taking place and will be taking place, do you think? Well, we're certainly, uh, as a community, very passionate about it, uh, and certainly the, the, uh, the government's green finance strategy, which we published in July, the formation of the Green Finance Institute, which will sit in London, um, not only for the benefit of the UK economy, but for international economy. And so we're partnering up through a whole series, at the moment, of bilateral engagements, and, and we want to establish a bilateral engagement with Australia in that capacity, because it's only by... Um, achieving um, that multilateral engagement that we're really going to address the challenges that we face around because sustainability. I, it's not a single country issue per se. We've got to work together. When you look at a, a, a business like Macquarie Bank, for example, yeah. and their green bonds, this yeah. rise of green yeah. bonds, I, they don't seem to be a huge part of the market. They're growing. A total issuance, I think, in this year will be 250 bill. Yeah. If I put to you the problems are they're less liquid than conventional bonds, yeah. uh, the labelling for investors is difficult, yeah. the protection for investors if issuers yeah. renege on their environmental commitments. Yeah. These are all challenges. Yeah. How do you think we're going to go with this sort of green finance? So they are challenges, and just because they're difficult doesn't mean to say we don't need to pursue them. But I think what we are also seeing is, if I can call it, the popularism of the environmental agenda really taking hold, all right? Uh, not just in some cases, sadly, in a, in a violent manner, but, but the, the genuine desire of investors, and that's one of the big switches in the UK, the genuine desire of investors, pension holders, etc., to, and the democratisation of pensions, to say, look, we want to own ESG, environmental, socially, and, and governance, you know, that those asset classes, that's driving the agenda. So it is, it's a combination of actually these are financially sound investments. You know, we, we, the acceleration towards sustainable financing means that we will end up, if we're not careful, with stranded assets. So being really clear about where that's likely to occur and therefore ensuring that investors are making the right decisions all of this thing, I think, is leading in the positive direction. But like any, any um, emerging industry, emerging business, you know, the costs of the first entrance are, are normally greater than the efficiency achieved later on down the line. So that should not be a reason not to do it. We've got to continue to pioneer. We've got to continue to learn from each other uh, and see actually how we can m not only increase the efficiency, but actually increase the penetration. Lord Mayor Peter Eslin, I wish I had longer. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much indeed.